So, JSON Web Tokens, who's ever heard of them? Closer to my mouth. So, who's ever heard of JSON Web Tokens? Go grab a beer. Okay, um, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Sam. I'm a developer evangelist at Auth0. If you have any questions about Auth0, come talk to me afterwards. Um, I'm on GDE and I organize meetups in Belgium called Frontiers. And you can find me on the internet as Sam Bego. So, oh, I have cat stickers. If somebody likes cat stickers, come show me your, your pet and I'll give you cat stickers. Um, but let's get serious now. We're going to see a few things in this presentation. Um, traditional authentication, token-based authentication, and then I'm going to try to explain what a token is. Um, so let's get started with traditional authentication. And what I mean with traditional authentication on the web is um, web, web apps which um, are generated on the server. So every page that every page change triggers a refresh of the browser, you get a new page, all the logic happens on the server. And it looks a bit like this. You have a user, goes to the browser, types in your website, um, like this. And you uh, just request a page and the server does what it does. It sends back a page, nothing special, until you encounter a page that is protected. Um, so then you're going to say, hey user, this page is protected. Please give me your credentials, your username, password, or whatever you want to use. Um, send them along to the server. And once the server has decided, like, yeah, this username password is, is OK, it's going to return the web page you requested. Um, it's not only going to return that, uh, that web page, it's also going to return a session cookie most of the time. So the next time you visit that page or any other protected page, you just send along that cookie. You don't have to log in again and again and again, because that's annoying. And then once you send that cookie, it will validate that cookie. And if that cookie is OK, you get your web page. Clear, right? This is how we used to make web apps and how we still do. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just a, an approach to web apps. Um, we're going to see the difference between these web apps and single page applications. Um, so the traditional ar architecture, you have one app, one server. It's kind of straightforward. They communicate with each other or everything happens on this one server. Um, simple as this. But then you get a single page architecture where you can have something like this. You have your single page running on a certain domain. You have an API. You have a user API. You have a uh, payment API. You have microservices. Um, and all these, these services need to know who is authenticated. And this can be a bit tricky if you're working with cookies and stuff like this. Um, you can also have something like this. A mobile app, a web app, and a desktop app, which all connects to the same server. Now. I don't know if you know, but mobile apps and desktop apps, they don't really use cookies. That's something we on the web use, but those platforms don't really use cookies. So it would be nice if we could just authenticate in the same way across all platforms. Um, so what are the, some of the problems with traditional cookie-based approach? Cookies don't like cores. Who likes cores? One, one person? You're a brave person. <laughs> I don't like it either. It's really just, it's annoying. And cookies don't really like it. You cannot really, you can, but it's really annoying to use cookies with um, cross origins. Cookies require states because you send a session in that cookie, which you have to keep somewhere on a server, like a list of all the valid sessions, and you have to validate against those that list every time um, the browser sends that cookie to you. Um, and cookies on flow. You can have a cookie issued by a certain servers, server, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it works with all the servers in your backend. So cookies don't flow from one server to another. For example, like this, the cookie could be issued by API, by the first API, the first service, but it doesn't mean that uh, the second service knows what to do or can access that cookie in general. Um, so what's the solution? Token-based authentication. Um, so we have this user who's going to access a web page, um, a single page application in this, in this case, so it doesn't really matter. Um, same, same story, the page is protected, so we send our credentials. And once the credentials are okay, the server is going to send a token. This can be much more complicated, it's just a simplified version of how token-based authentication works. Um, so if your credentials match, um, you're going to get an access token. And you're going to keep this in your browser, and every time that you want to access a protected resource, a server, a certain API or something like this, you're going to send along this access token. 
And once this checks out, it's a valid access token, you get your data from your API and your single page gets rendered in your browser. So, to sum up, the user fills, fills in the login form, we pass along the data. Once the data is okay, we return an access token and then we pass along this access token every time we want to access a protected resource. So let's see it in action. We have, I have this little local API here, which is um, protected. So if I try to access it, it says no authorization token was found. Um, so let's give it one. Is this big enough for the people in the back? No? Let's see if I can uh, enlarge it. Yeah, it's going to be like this then. Um, so once we send along a a Nexus token as a Barrett token, we get a cat image. Um, but not only this, this token has some meaning. It's not just a random um, piece of text. If I copy, for example, an expired web, web token, our API will know that this token is not valid anymore and will tell us this token is expired. So a token does not necessarily have to be just a random piece of string text. It can have some meaning. Um, like for example, this one was expired. If you want to do it in JavaScript, I don't know if there's that many JavaScript developers in this conference, um, you can do it something like this, where the important part is that in your header you send a bearer token with a token. Who's ever heard of OAuth? Oh, of course you do. Stupid question. Who's ever heard of OpenID Connect? Of course you do. Stupid question. Um, and that can look some, something like this. You have a user, you have your single page application in this case, and it's going to try to authenticate with an external um, or an internal, a separate uh, microservice for authentication. It's going to send your credentials, and it's going to get back the access token. We've seen this before. But it's not only going to get back your access token, it's going to get back a refresh token and an ID token, um, because your access token is going to be valid for a very short period of time. If you want to renew it, you use your refresh token. And your ID token is just going to contain a bit more of information about the authenticated user. So then you have your access token. Um, you pass it on to your API. You get some stuff back. We've seen this before. But will your user have to log in every time that you visit that he visits the website? Because we haven't seen save these tokens. They were sent to the browser. But what then? Who saved these tokens in local storage, a cookie or something like this? One person, two person. I think almost everybody has done this at a certain point, or still does this. Um, but they can be susceptible to cross-site scripti scripting. So there's another solution like this. The login flow stays, stays the same. Um, we get our cookies, uh, we get our tokens back, but we also get a cookie back, a cookie from our authentication server. Um, which we keep in our browser. And the next time you visit this website, we're not going to, uh, we're going to do a silent request to our authentication server. This is usually done in an iframe. So in the background, our single page application is going to request all the tokens and save them in memory. This means with every visit, we're going to have to request the tokens, but we don't save them somewhere persistently, like in local storage, which makes them a little less susceptible to cross-site scripting. So you send the cookie, you get your tokens, and then you can use them to get your data. Does this approach approach self course? Who says it does? I, th I say it does because tokens you can pass along tokens to any server you have as long as they have the ability to validate those tokens. Does this approach self flow? You can pass them along to any server. It doesn't have to be the same domain. With, like with cross, it doesn't have to be the same domain. It can, but it also you can pass them along from one server to another as long as each server knows how to validate those tokens. And this is approach keep self keeps keeping state. It kind of does. If you would save your tokens in your browser, it would. Um, but since we're going to request them every time we visit your single page application, you kind of need some state, but two out of three, it's not that bad. But I've been talking about tokens, but what is a token? Um, I should have started with this, um, but it's quite a big piece of this presentation. So what is a token? 
I'm going to talk about JSON Web Tokens. A token in general can be anything. It can be an opaque stri string with some random characters. It can be a piece of XML like a SAML token. I'm going to talk about JSON Web Tokens. And it looks a bit like this. It's important to notice that there's three parts in a JSON Web Token. The header, the payload, and the signature, which are um, in different colors, and they're divided by a dot. So a JSON Web Token is made of three different parts the header, and this is actually just a base 64 string of a JSON object. In this case, it tells us which algorithm was used to sign the token and uh, which type of token it is, a JSON web token. The second part, the payload, is just a base 64 um, of a JSON object, again, and it can have anything that's valid JSON inside of it. Um, it says who the subject is, it's my user ID, uh, my given name, my family name, my username, and it's issued at this, type, this timestamp. Um, you can also add an expiry date in this if you want your tokens to expire at a certain time, which you probably should do, which I probably should have put in this uh, example, but anyway. And there's a few different types of claims. First, you have the reserved claims, which are the claims that are specified in the specification of JSON Web Tokens like the subject, the issuer, the issued add date, or the expiry date. Then you have public claims, which is a list of claims listed by the uh, IANAS, IANA, I think it's called, uh, foundation, which is basically just a list of claims which they encourage you to use, so you, all APIs of all different companies kind of work the same. So if you want to send back a um, first name, you use a given name instead of a first name, for example. It's stupid, but if everybody does this, all APIs or all tokens can be a little bit more universal. And then lastly, you have private claims, and this can just be any valid JSON you want. It um, can also be an array, can also be a string, can also be a number, can also be a boolean, can have whatever you want it, it to be. Um, and then the last part is the signature. And what you do is basically, you take a base64 of your header, you append it with a dot, and then take the base64 of your payload, and then just, in this case, add a secret. And this, is allows, this allows us to validate if a token is valid or not, if it has been tempered with or not. Uh, so JSON Web Tokens can be verified. Um, your super secret key usually looks something like this, which are random characters. Um, and this is a case for um, the algorithm we chose here, which is HMAX, uh, of HMAC. It's really difficult to pronounce algorithms. Um, but if you use some other algorithms, you might not use a key or a secret. You might use a private key and a public key. Oh, I'm going ahead of myself. So here we have a header, and we can base 64, big 64 fi it, a payload, and then we sign this with a secret. And basically, if you just um, put these three, these three things together, you get a JSON Web Token. So a JSON Web Token is nothing more than just three parts put together and sent as a token. If you want to do it in JavaScript, it looks a bit like this. Um, anyway, like I was saying, you can sign your tokens symmetrically with HMAC, or you can use another algorithm like RSA or ECD. S A or S R S A P S. It's all difficult to pronounce, um, but these are asymmetrical uh, algorithms, which means they have a private key which signs um, your your token, and they have a public key public key which allows you to validate if the token is signed by that private key. Um, and if you want to share one of these keys, you can do this a lot of different ways. Some people put them inside the, web, the public key inside of a web token, JSON web token. But you can also do some, use something like a JSON web key, which looks like this, and which is a bunch of um, crypto cryptographical information. But it's important to know that your public key is inside of this. And by using this, you can verify if your token is valid. So let's say you use Facebook's login, uh, which is, issues a token. It will then, or it could then, um, provide you with a JSON web key so you can verify that that token issued by, J by Facebook is a valid token. So let's make a little comparison. We have my passport here. I'm from Belgium, so it kind of looks a bit like this, which is kind of the same as the header of our token. It says what it is, and 
um, this is a JSON web token and it's signed with this algorithm. This is my passport, it's from Belgium and it's a passport. The payload looks a bit like this, it's my name, my photo, my nationality, uh, when it expires and stuff like this. It's kind of the same as, as your payload, it has all this information about this web token inside of it. And lastly, you have your signature, which is basically just some means to verify that it's a valid token or a valid passport. We have this website called jsonwebtokens.io. If you want to know about, want to know more about web tokens, um, looks a bit like this. You can enter your token and see the content, uh, and vice versa. We don't save your tokens, by the way, because a lot of people have questions about this. We do not. So let's summarize. Using session cookies is hard with single page applications. Um, it just is. Nobody likes cores. If you have a microservice architecture, it gets hard as well. Um, so it's sometimes easier to just use tokens to authenticate yourself with all of your service, all of your services. Um, stateless authentication is possible if you would save your tokens somewhere in the front end. If you are building a mobile app, it could be easier to save it because you have a bit more sandboxed environment if you're using the web. The web is still the web. Um, and JSON Web Tokens consist out of three parts. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in fact, I just uh, put uh, something like that on the, the, company of my, uh, of the website of my company. And the OWASP website uh, advised to use a cookie even for GWT. To, um, to avoid uh, cross-site scripting yes. and using the uh, same site to avoid CCR? Yeah, that's like I said with the silent request, you're not going to save your tokens, you're just going to save a session cookie, which you will send in the background every time you visit the website, which is going to get the tokens so you can then use them once you've got them again. Um, this avoids you having to save your tokens so somebody else being able to steal them. So that's what that cookie is used for. Is that clear or? Yeah, okay. Uh, so basically, as I understand, uh, there is no way to invalidate the JSON web token. Uh, so, is there a good uh, practice <laughs> to somehow? This is. Um, usually done by something like a blacklist, like if you have tokens, because JSON Web Tokens usually contain their own data, if they're valid or not, their expiry date, their issuer, uh, their signature. Um, so if, for example, you issue a JSON Web Token, which is valid until tomorrow, but tonight you decide it's not valid for some reason, you can add it to a blacklist and then you can just still check um, for tokens in that blacklist before you really decide that it's a valid um, JSON Web Token. So that's one of the ways that it's usually done by using a blacklist. All right. Oh, a lot of questions now. So I have a very basic question. Mm -hmm. In traditional cookie-based authentication, uh, you get the benefit of the session handling in, in web containers, at least J2E containers. Is there anything similar for uh, JSON? I think every language or any framework you want to use has some library to work with JSON Web Tokens. In fact, if you go to this website, it has a whole list here for any language and framework of libraries which help you use um, JSON Web Tokens and which are usually just simple middlewares, middlewares which handle JSON Web Tokens. So yeah, it should be quite easy to do in any um, environment. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, for asymmetric signing, there's a lot of algorithm. Some are broken, like vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Some are already long, so they produce long token. Can you <coughs> advise us on a nice algorithm to use today that is also implemented in a library? Like um, the same goes for the libraries. Um, on this website you can see this, for example, this C library has all these algorithms which it supports. So it depends on the library and um, which algorithms it supports. Um, JSON Web Tokens usually support these algorithms. It's useful, this website, I should always put it open, which are 
um, the most commonly used um, algorithms with JSON Web Tokens, um, and almost all of them are asymmetrically, except HMAX. Does that answer your question, more or less? Okay. Questions again? Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned the plan is to uh, reduce the uh, risk of, uh, well, to revoke tokens. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, the purpose of GWT is to avoid the states and checking every time you receive a request. Yes. So, is, so if you have a blacklist, you need to maintain states. Yes, and that's uh, why that's why I had an asterisk behind um, does this solve state because in theory it does solve state because a JSON Web token can prove its authenticity and it's it's valid valid if it's valid or not. But then you have edge cases like if you want to revoke um, tokens before their expiry date has been met, for example, and then you have to find a way around it, which is a blacklist. So in most cases, it can solve state or keeping state, but sometimes you just need to have state. And unfortunately, there's no really other way to revoke access or to revoke tokens at this time. Not that I'm aware of, at least. I don't know if I will succeed to say that in English, but I will try. Go ahead. <laughs> you, you talk about uh, OpenID Connect. You yes. Talk about, uh, iframe, right? Yes. Uh, what kind of mode do you use for SPA? I'm talking about implicit mode. In implicit mode, I think you um, not have refresh token. I think, yeah. I think for an SPA, you usually use implicit. Um, flow okay. in um, OAuth and therefore also in OpenID Connect. Um, so you just ask an access token and a refresh token and you use them. You don't need an access or an authorization code first. You usually just talk to your, uh, your API um, without having an authorization code first. So the implicit flow, I would say. Okay. just wanted to clarify the two ask question. Uh, so it's like uh, when you have a set cookie parameter, you could set, uh, still set the cookie as whatever string you wanted. So the string that you set it as would be the JSON web token string. And in which case, every server request would contain the JSON web token string, and you could have your protection uh, so that it doesn't go into the JavaScript space. Uh, what can be done for the revocation in that case is that when you get this kind of invalid tokens, you can revoke it at the time from the server because, yeah, you have a set cookie parameter from where you can revoke it. Of course, the state would be maintained by the client and not by the server. So that was what OAS suggested when you were using JSON web tokens instead of using it as a JavaScript uh, variable, using it as part of the cookie parameter. All right, thank you for clarifying. Are there any more questions? We still have a minute. Let's grab a beer. Yes, <laughs> that was my next subject. Uh, I was I wanted to say it was an amazing crowd for our uh, last uh, session of the day. Um, so I think everyone has been so serious today. So there's a cocktail now, happy hour, sponsored by VP Tech. It's downstairs, so I hope you're not going away right now. And for those who are going away now, I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>